Hey everyone, this is Mike. Uh, this is my free YouTube channel. Uh, it is Saturday, December 17th. It is around 5 o'clock Eastern. Uh, please remember to subscribe to this channel and like this video. If you do like these videos, I do put them out once a week, so make sure you subscribe to this channel. And uh, if you really like these videos, I do these every single day in my Reading the Markets uh, subscription service on the Seeking Alpha platform. Uh, the link is provided in the uh, description section of the write-up. Uh, and so when we look at this week, it was a very pivotal week. And, um, you know, it looked almost as if the bulls were going to run away with things at the beginning of the week. But then we ended up finishing lower by 2% this week, which followed last week's decline of over 3%. And um, the CPI report certainly got things moving higher. And for the bulls, uh, you could see we even had that run up going into the close on Monday, which really made absolutely no sense. Uh, but that's what happened, obviously, in anticipation of a better than expected print. Uh, and that's what we got, a 7.1% uh, CPI print versus a, a, a consensus of 7.3. I was actually in the camp that I thought the number might come in a little bit higher based off of that uh, C, uh, Cleveland Fed CPI data. But um, I'm not sure anymore if the Cleveland Fed's going to be a good, reliable source because of uh, the way they tend to track things. I'm not... Uh, I'm not really sure that it's going to be as reliable to me as a source as it was in the past. I think if inflation is beginning to uh, recede, uh, that it is likely that uh, that's going to probably be more of a trailing indicator than a leading indicator. Uh, what is important to note, though, is that despite the better than expected uh, CPI reading on the headline and, and even on the core, which came down just a little bit, it's important to remember that the Fed cares a lot about these sticky measures of inflation. And the Atlanta Fed uh, sticky measure, which I look at the 12-month year over uh, the year-over-year -year figure, uh, came actually hit a new high of 6.6 percent. Again, I mean, I just look at the sticky one because I think uh, this is a good measure in terms of what the Fed is sort of looking at. Um, and again, I mean, you can slice these, you can slice and dice these numbers and try to come up with any sort of formulation you want. I just try to look at them on a year-over-year -year and month-over-month -month basis, and um, that's all I can really do, right? I mean, I, I don't have access to all sorts of uh, other data, but this seems to be one of the metrics that I'm, I'm focusing on right now. And obviously wage growth is another another metric. And at the end of the day, the, the, the Fed meeting didn't really seem to be swayed by the uh, release of the CPI data. In fact, as we were sort of thinking about last week, we did get that 5.1% number on the Fed funds projections for 2023. And what was really impressive about it, remember, we had talked about a number of Fed governors that were in favor of it. There were 17 governors that were above the 5% mark and just two that were below the 5% mark. So that seems like a very um, united sort of Fed and a very um, strong indication that the Fed is probably going to be looking to get the mid rate up to 5% this year. Whether they do it or not by the end of the year doesn't really matter. It's the idea that they're trying to convince the market that they are going to do it, and that matters uh, quite a bit. And so I have a feeling that if the Fed doesn't continue to see financial conditions tightening in the manner in which they do, the odds of this number really increase. If, uh, if financial conditions do begin to tighten and that begins to weigh on the economy, then we may not have to go to 5%. It really is going to depend a lot on what the market does for the Fed. The more heavy lifting the market does for the Fed, the less the Fed will have to tighten at the end of the day. Uh, and so the, what the Fed is really trying to do is sort of jawbone the market into a position that the market can do a lot of the heavy lifting for it. You know, And one way that you can keep track of uh, where financial conditions are is just by looking at the Chicago Fed National Financial Conditions Index they come out every week, every Wednesday morning at 8.30. Uh, you can find that on the Chicago Fed website. And, um, you know, basically when this number is up, rising towards zero, it's an indication of financial conditions tightening. And when it's falling away from zero, it's an, a an indication of financial conditions easing. And so, I mean, you've seen that financial conditions have actually eased all the way back to where they were back in the middle of August before um, Jackson Hole, really. And you have to think about this. They raised rates 75 basis points in September. They raised, base, raised 75 basis points in November. And they raised rates another 50 basis points this past week. So we've had 200 basis points of tightening 
but yet financial conditions are in exactly in the same place as where they were at the end of July. And so that is what the Fed needs to undo, right? It needs this these financial conditions to uh, move back up towards zero, and they really need them to stay there for some time. The sooner that happens, the sooner the market cooperates, uh, the more likely it is that the Fed won't have to raise the terminal rate above 5%. Uh, and so it really is a, an interesting sort of scenario. It's almost as if the more the market fights the Fed, the harder it's making, the, it's, the more likely it is that the Fed's going to have to continue to raising rates. It's almost like, uh, you know, when you're a kid uh, and you want your parents to go and buy you a toy, it's almost like the more you nag them sometimes, the less likely they are to go out and buy it for you because you're not behaving well. Uh, and so it's a very similar situation with the Fed. I mean, the more the market fights the Fed, the more likely it is the Fed's going to have to actually raise the rates above 5%. And so that's sort of just the situation we're in. And really this week, the pivotal point of the week was really what happened on the ECB. This was this was Wednesday afternoon after the Fed. You can see markets sold off after the Fed and the dot plot came out. We sold off really basically instantly uh, as soon as those numbers came out. And then we sort of stabilized around the 4,000 region. The reason we stabilized here intraday was because this was where the big gamma level was uh, going into that day. And so that's sort of the center of gravity in the market. And that's sort of the level where the market is going to gravitate towards going into a big option expiration. Uh, and so, but the next day we broke that big gamma level. And once we broke it, it was sort of like it was starting to get away uh, and the puts down lower, below 4,000, began to get energized, began to see their premiums rise, and that allowed the market to move lower. The reason why we really got this big gap down the next Thursday, we may have gapped down anyway, but the, the big reason why I think we gapped down was because of what happened in Europe on Thursday. What happened in Europe on Thursday, you can see this was the DAX Wednesday, and this was the DAX Thursday morning. We gapped lower. But notice right around here at 8 o'clock in the morning, we take a, a very decisive turn down. This was when the ECB came out and did its monetary policy statement. And this was surprisingly hawkish. This was not what I think the market was expecting. In fact, you can see by the way the market moved, it was not what was expected. And, and really the biggest damage was done during the press conference because uh, there's been this sort of idea in the market, remember, that everyone is is slowing down, everyone is – all central banks are slowing down. All central banks are going to this 50 basis point rate hike. And, um, you know, Lagarde sort of really pushed back a lot on that. She said, based on the information that we have available today, that predicates another 50 basis point rate hike at our next meeting and possibly at the one after that and possibly thereafter. But everything will be also determined by a review of the data. So don't assume that this is a one shot 50. It's more than that. I don't know how many more times... So it shouldn't be regarded as the new normal, but the current circumstances, we believe that this is the right approach on a steady pace basis. Uh, and then she goes on to say, because they started asking about the pivot, uh, and then she goes on to say, um, this was actually a really interesting exchange. The question, uh, yesterday the Federal Reserve decided to slow down the pace of hiking rates. What is the implication for the ECB monetary policy? Of course, I know monetary policy decisions are made by each central bank, but is it possible the ECB will continue to raise interest rates after the FRB has finished raising rates? And then she goes on to say, thank you for your question because it helps me to clarify one thing. Anybody who thinks that this is a pivot for the ECB is wrong. We are not pivoting. We're not wavering. We are showing determination and resilience and continuing a journey where we have. And then, you know, she goes on to say, this is not a pivot. We are not slowing down. We are in it for the long game. Uh, she goes on to say again, so it is. So I know that it's tempting to assume that, oh, well, all central banks are doing the same thing at the same time. Not quite. The ECB is not pivoting. Uh, and with that, the market just, you know, sold off. You saw, you saw, you know, 10-year rates in Italy just explode higher <laughs> following all this news. You know, the, the, the Italian 10-year goes from 390 to 430 over the course of two days. You get a, a move higher in the German two-year that goes from 216 to 244 in two days. The German 10-year goes from, you know, 195 to 215 in two days. The Italian 10-year goes from uh, three, 390 to 428. The Italian two-year goes from 270 to 311. So, 
you know, this is sort of what really rocked the boat on 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 Thursday. And this is what really just I think over, this is what really sort of just gave the market that last gas because I think maybe there was some hope and a holdout that maybe the ECB wasn't going to follow through, was not going to be as hawkish that, you know, maybe all these central banks are sort of coordinating indirectly a slowdown. And that just wasn't the case. Uh, and so basically what you're seeing now is two major central banks, the two leading central banks of the world, the ECB and the Fed, both saying they need financial conditions to tighten more. And they are both nowhere near done. And so if you want to use the Fed sort of new sl sling, um, if you want to use the Fed's new slang and lingo of cumulative effects, well, I would say that the cumulative effects of, of monetary policy are having an adverse reaction to the markets, right? Because you have these two major central banks that are telling you they are nowhere near done. And the, the market just got it flat out wrong because the market was betting that the Fed was going to pivot, that the Fed was going to slow down, that the going only 50 was an indication that they were not going to be as aggressive as, as everyone thought, despite every nearly half of the Fed governors coming out over the past six weeks telling you that rates were going to be higher than they were in September, and for, despite Powell coming out in November saying rates were going to be higher than where they were in September, they all many of the Fed governors, as we talked about last week, were talking about rates going above 5%. And guess what? The dot plot showed they were going over 5% and there was no division whatsoever with 17 of the 19 board members voting in favor. Uh, I'm sorry, indicating indicating uh, separately that they saw rates going over 5% in 2023. So that is a massive shock. And if the whole rally was predicated on this idea that inflation was coming down and the Fed was wavering or that the ECB was wavering, that is just not the case. And that probably means this entire rally gets wiped out over the next couple of weeks. Uh, you can see that we've already come down and we've already started to uh, fill the gap here. Uh, and we're now in between. 3750 would be the next area I would be looking for for resistance. I mean, almost preferably, I would rather see the market first move back up to 3970, fill the gap up here, and then move down so that you can fill that gap and get it out of the way. But ultimately, I think we're going to go back to this 3585 area, and I think we're going to fill that gap. And I think if we get down there, depending on how quickly we get down there, we could even see new lows before this is all said and done, because the market has just gotten it completely wrong. Even if inflation does come down, the Fed doesn't care about headline CPI. They care about core PCE. They care about core CPI. And even within those numbers, they care about specific segments. And they're looking at a, a, a labor market that has got a 3.7% unemployment rate, massive imbalances, wages that are rising much higher than they like them. Uh, consumer inflation expectations up above 3% according to the University of Michigan on a longer term basis. And these are all going in the directions that they do not want them to go. Uh, and, and, and so it's just going to be a continued battle of trying to get rates to move higher on the long end of the curve, rates to kind of stay elevated on the short end of the curve. And I think that, you know, as we sort of keep going now, I think that the, the more the market fights the Fed, the more likely it is the Fed's going to continue to elevate its hawkish rhetoric and it's going to become more, it's going to become stronger and I think it's going to become more persistent that they were going to try to scare this market lower in terms of equity valuations and try to get rates higher because that's how you tighten financial conditions and that's how ultimately the Fed will slow the economy enough to bring the labor market and the inflation rate back into balance and where they want them to be. Anyway, that's all I have for you this week. Have a great week and I'll see you next. Bye.